can I check your ticket please? I handed the ticket that I had been twirling around in my hands for the past hour to the flight attendant. She nodded at it approvingly before producing a sheet of paper from the file that she was holding and placing it inside my folded ticket. Have a nice flight. She commented enthusiastically before handing my ticket back to me. I grabbed my ticket and stared at the folded sheet of paper inside my ticket curiously before finding my seat. Once I had settled down on my seat, I removed the folded sheet of paper from my ticket and placed the ticket in my bag. Upon unfolding the sheet of paper, I realized it was a handwritten note. The handwriting seemed rushed. I've transcribed the note from memory here. Rules for surviving this flight. 1. Do not speak of this sheet to any passenger. You are the only human on this flight. 2. Check the time on your phone after reading the sheet. All rules will apply based on the time of your phone. 3. During the first hour of your flight, do not talk to anyone. People may try to talk to you, but ignore them completely. 4. During the second hour of the flight, you may start talking again, but if anyone mentions the window, do not look outside the window under any circumstances. 5. If you hear a child crying in the cabin, immediately run to the bathroom. 6. If the screen of your entertainment console suddenly goes black, immediately look away and do not stare at it. 7. During the third hour of the flight, the captain will make an announcement. Follow the instructions. 8. During the fourth hour of the flight, do not sit in your seat. 9. If you make it past the fourth hour, you will need to spend the rest of the flight evading the chaser. You will know who the chaser is when you see them. 10. The captain will make an announcement of the plane landing. As soon as you hear this announcement, push your way to the exit door and open it. 11. You will find that the outside is simply a black void. Jump into it without hesitation. I reread the rules again while chuckling. And did they give one of these to every passenger or was I somehow randomly chosen for this prank? I checked the time on my phone just to humor the list. 7.13 AM. So, this would be the first hour of the flight. Suddenly a young man walked over to my seat and sat right beside me. I gave him a casual side glance and saw that he was carrying what looked like to be a laptop bag. Great, I thought. He'll work on whatever he's doing and leave me alone for the flight. The men didn't even bother to exchange a single word with me as he settled down in his seat and put on his seatbelt. He stared straight ahead and completely avoided me. I let him be and started to fiddle with my flight console. Some people just like to be left alone, I guess. Soon enough, the captain made an announcement of the plane starting and the steady hum of the plane engine started to vibrate the entire cabin. The plane started to accelerate until the G-force pushed me into my seat. Moments later, I felt the plane rising into the air. I am typically not scared of flights, but getting on a flight always makes me a bit nervous. This time though, my stomach was in knots and beads of sweat were running down my forehead. My instincts told me that I was stepping into danger, grave danger. I dismissed my thoughts and that awful gut feeling, jogging it down to feeling a little creeped out by the note. The young man on my left suddenly tapped on my shoulder. I jolted up like I had just been electrocuted. Even through my jacket, his hand felt cold. Cold and heavy, like a dead person's hand. I turned around and faced the young man. His face seemed wrong. You know how those realistic human robots can creep people out because of how close to humans they are, yet subconsciously we can tell that they aren't human. This man was giving me that same unsettling feeling, and his facial features were just artificial in a way that I couldn't place. Maybe it was his eyes, a little too big, the pupils abnormally dilated. Or maybe it was his nose not exactly in the center of his face. Or perhaps it was his mouth, lips way too thin and long. 
And don't get me wrong, he didn't look obnoxiously fake. In fact, it was those very subtle blemishes in his facial features that made him look like something and trying to look like a human. And then he spoke. His voice was normal. Upon hearing it, the man seemed to look normal too when I thought I was just freaking out for no reason. Hey, do you wear headphones? He asked. That was a weird question to ask. Do you want headphones? I was about to open my mouth to speak when he spoke again. How would you feel if I cut your hand off right now? What was disturbing wasn't the nature of the question itself, but the fact that he spoke in such a calm manner. It was as if he was asking me how my day was. Suddenly, my mind went to the list of rules that I had subconsciously been squeezing in my hand. The first rule said to not talk to anyone on the flight, no matter how much they try to talk to you. I decided to ignore the man. He seemed really weird anyways, and if I was being honest, the list of rules wasn't the reason that I chose to ignore him. He stopped pestering me and returned to work on his laptop. I looked over at his laptop slowly and gasped at what I saw on his screen. He had a photo of me on his screen. And that's it, nothing else. Just a full screen photo of me. And before I could process that properly, I looked over at his keyboard and noticed that it wasn't a standard keyboard. In fact, it really wouldn't even count as a keyboard. It was made up of oddly shaped keys, all marked with strange letters that I doubt existed. The man continued to stare intently at the photo of me on his screen. It was then that I realized that the list of rules wasn't a joke. Suddenly, a flight attendant popped out of nowhere and asked me, Sir, is this man bothering you? Yes, he is. I replied before my voice caught up in my throat. In under a second, everyone in the cabin snapped their heads around until they were staring directly at me. Their faces, they all looked wrong. Inhuman. Slowly, their long, thin lips curled into wide smiles and red tears started to roll down their faces. What had moments before been a fairly typical flight had now turned into a nightmare. I sat there, cornered in my seat as the entire cabin of people had their faces turned to me, eyes locked with me. Red tears were rolling down their uncanny faces, and their lips were curled into impossibly wide smiles. The flight attendant that had tricked me into talking to her also did the same thing, now completely silent. I waited for them to jump me, to attack me, but they did absolutely nothing. Seconds dragged into minutes, yet the people just stared. They didn't make an effort to move. It looked like they were locked in place, just staring at me. As the initial shock wore off and my ravaged heartbeat started to slow down, I started to think about what to do. I had obviously broken the first rule, but apart from being a little unnerved, it hadn't caused much harm to me. The plane's PA system turned on again and the captain made an announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, we are coming across some unexpected turbulence. Please remain in your seats to stay safe. His voice was monotone and void of emotion. Every single syllable made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Everyone in the cabin seemed to dismiss my presence at that moment and returned to their usual things. The cabin returned to normal and I nearly convinced myself that I just had a very realistic nightmare. It wasn't until I saw the young man's laptop next to me that I realized it wasn't over yet. His laptop was still the same with a keyboard from another world. And most importantly, he still had a picture of me on his screen. He continued to stare at it and tap the keys on his keyboard as if he was typing something. I reread the list of rules and noticed the seventh rule. During the third hour of the flight, the captain will make an announcement. Follow the instructions. The rule sheet stated that the captain would make an announcement during the third hour of the flight. Yet as I checked my phone, I realized... I was still in the first hour of the flight. Either breaking the rule had changed the complete course of things, or the rule sheet simply didn't account for all scenarios. 
I desperately hoped that the latter was true because otherwise, the precious rule sheet that was supposed to get me out of here would now be worthless. A sudden jolt across the whole cabin interrupted my thoughts. The captain had a lie about the turbulence. In fleeting moments, the entire plane was shaking. There was nothing against looking through the window in the rolls. Apart from during the second hour or so, I pulled up the blind on the tiny circular plane window and gasped when I saw the outside. All I saw was a thick black void that seemed to undulate like rich black velvet. I saw the lights from the plane start to get warped and twisted as the beams traveled through the void. Don't get me wrong, the void wasn't just completely black. No, it was full of void, rays, twisting and warping. The best I can describe the void's movement is like an ocean of thick black waves. My mind went to every sci-fi movie and book that I had ever read, and entertained the thought that I was inside a wormhole, or perhaps a black hole. How the regular Boeing plane managed to not get crushed in this physics-bending space was an impossible question to answer. I slowly turned my head away from the window. It took a lot of willpower to look away as if something from those inky black depths had hypnotized me. Everyone in the cabin seemed completely oblivious to what was happening and continued to go on about their regular business. I checked the time on my phone and my heart skipped a beat. An entire hour had passed in just those few moments I spent looking out into the void. I quickly looked over at the rule sheet to see what I would have to do for the second hour of the flight. During the second hour of the flight, you may start talking again but if anyone mentions the window, do not look outside the window in any circumstances. While the rule did state that it was okay to talk, I really didn't want to talk to anyone in this cabin. I also reread the rule about going to the washroom when I heard a child crying and also not looking at my in-flight entertainment console if the screen turns black. It all seemed pretty standard stuff, and I thought that I had seen the worst already. This gave me newfound motivation to follow all the rules to the dot and get out of here quickly. I started to head out to the washroom to relieve myself, knowing that I would be busy during the third and fourth hours of the flight. As I was walking to the washroom, a woman frantically caught up with me. She seemed absolutely frightened. Hey, um, are you... are you also stuck here? She asked while looking me up and down. Did you also get the set of rules? I said. Yeah, but I lost the sheet. Can I just read yours? She pleaded. I considered it for a moment and decided to give her my sheet because she seemed really desperate. It felt good to have someone else be in the same situation as me, because now I could rely on someone else to help me out. I gave her the sheet and she thanked me profusely. After giving it a quick read, much to my relief, she handed it back to me. I'm Sarah, by the way, she said. Well, nice to meet you, I'm Ethan, I replied. We need to get out of here and I think our best bet is following these rules. That's right, and I'm glad I'm not the only person here on this flight, she said. About the others, well, they don't seem human to me. She seemed to have calmed down a bit, a bit too quickly. It felt like she was putting up a facade, but I chalked it up to being on edge from the situation that we were in. So, um, I guess we got another half an hour until the third hour starts, she said. We suddenly started to hear the shrill cries of a child in the cabin. She immediately took my hand and rushed us both over to the washroom. There, we spent the next few minutes listening to those shrill cries get more and more inhuman as the minutes passed. And just before they finally died down, they were high-pitched shrieks that still ring on my ears to this day. My left ear started to literally bleed as the frequency of the sound ruptured my eardrum. Sarah seemed unfazed by the sound. I guess it affects different people differently. Soon enough, it was the third hour of the flight, and the captain made another announcement in his emotionless, monotone voice. Ladies and gentlemen, please proceed to the front of the plane. Absolutely no one in the cabin moved. I looked at Sarah, and she nodded at me, giving me the affirmative to go to the front. 
and we both started to walk to the front of the plane, basing through rows and rows of people comfortably lounging in their seats. No one seemed to have even heard the announcement. At the front of the plane, I saw the door to the pilot's cockpit was open. I walked inside with Sarah right behind me and I noticed two things. One, there was no pilot. And two, outside the plane, I could see a vast red land with fire and lava crisscrossing the dried earth like rivers and purple trees dotting the barren landscape. I stared into the outside, shocked at the otherworldly landscape. The place wasn't uninhabited though. Large concrete buildings were concentrated in several areas. Where we had arrived, I had no idea. Sarah started to laugh behind me. It was at that moment that all the pieces of the puzzle had clicked together in my head. I realized why Sarah felt so off. She knew what time it was on my phone even though she had never checked it. There was no way she could have known which hour of the flight it was unless she had her own phone, which she never did. She wasn't affected by that shrill, high-pitched scream in the cabin. She was acting way too calm like she knew exactly what was happening. As I felt Sarah's nails dig into both my shoulders, I realized that the list of rules had failed me when I had broke the first one. I had changed the course of things and those rules no longer had a time frame. Sarah continued to dig her nails into my shoulders and pierce my skin through my jacket. She leaned in close and whispered, I am the chaser. I was stuck in a bit of a pickle. The chaser had tricked me and cornered me in the cockpit and the plane seemed to have traveled to another dimension. I probably would have had a panic attack and mental breakdown at that moment, but I had something more important to deal with. The nails of Sarah, or the chaser I guess, continued to dig into my shoulder and they stabbed through my jacket and my skin. She seemed to possess inhuman strength in the way she easily punctured my jacket and then my skin with just a blunt nail. But as I slowly turned my head around, I realized Sarah was truly just a facade. She had transformed into something else entirely. Her skin was gone completely white like a sheet of paper and her fingers now ended in jagged, sharp, yellow fingernails. Her face had warped into a misfigured eyes, nose, and mouth that barely resembled the Sarah that I had gotten to know. I quickly pushed her back against her and kind of fell on her to push myself and her out of the cockpit. You don't truly know what you're capable of until you get that adrenaline surge and a survival situation. When your primal instincts take over, you don't think about anything that you do. And then, as soon as I was free from her grasp, I ran. I won't bore you with the details of the next 30 minutes of me running back and forth around the plane to avoid the chaser. At first, I thought the other passengers would react, maybe catch me or something, but they were all gone. The entire plane was empty and it was only me and the chaser. I was starting to get tired and lose energy when the captain's voice broadcasted over the PA system once more. The plane is landing at our destination. Please, buckle your seatbelts. The chaser took one final look at me before disappearing to the back of the plane. It puzzled me how the captain was now back in the cockpit and landing the plane. Curiosity overtook me, and I thought that I had seen the worst already, so I decided to walk to the front of the plane and check the cockpit again. The door to the cockpit was open and I could see a single man with his back to me operating the controls. He seemed normal enough but after what I had experienced on this plane, I knew the last person I wanted to bother would be the captain. I swear that I saw him turn his head around and look at me as I turned around and walked back. The plane landed eventlessly and those emergency rubber slides also opened up to service exits in a place where there were no airports. Before I left the plane, I salvaged as much food and water as I could. Some of you may say that I should have stayed in the plane. While that would have been a good move, how long would I last there? Days at the most weeks. It's best that I get myself used to this new dimension that I found myself in, rather than sit there and then look for food when I was starving. And of course, I still can't forget about the chaser, who I believe is still on the plane. 
The landscape was an endless red desert. The only thing that stood out in the landscape were the occasional purple trees and the towns of concrete buildings. The heat was unbearable. I looked up at the sky and saw three large suns in different positions, all radiating their heat and light onto this planet. The ground was incredibly dry and I doubt the place ever received any rain. In fact, there were several ravines that were filled with lava and molten rock. I knew that I couldn't even survive a day in this heat, and I had already completely soaked my clothes in sweat. I started to walk over to the closest concrete city that I could find. It only took me about 10 minutes to walk there, but those 10 minutes were absolute agony, as I struggled to keep on walking in the heat. The beams from the three suns burnt the skin on the back of my neck and ears as I walked for those 10 minutes. Just when I was about to pass out, I found the shade of a concrete building and I threw myself into it. The relief was instant, and while the temperature didn't suddenly drop, it was 100 times better than being out in the open. I finished an entire bottle of water in one sip and continued to lie down on the floor, nearly passing out from exhaustion and the heat. I didn't notice the suited man when he had walked in front of me. Welcome to hell, lost soul. He said that phrase like he had said it a million times and he was bored of it. He wore a black suit even in the sweltering heat and didn't seem to be a tiny bit uncomfortable. Hell... I asked, clearly confused at this man's statement. It may have been the heat getting to my head though because that would have not been confusing to me and would actually explain the previous events. Oh yes, son, this is hell. You're an unexpected visitor though. Usually we keep track of who's coming in. He sighed in a tone similar to one a teacher would use when their student asked a dumb question. Oh, don't worry though. It's not a rare occurrence to have people that come and go. I'm not sure if you'll be able to leave though, so I'll set you up with what you are going to have to do for eternity, he said, as if he was just doing his regular job. What do I have to do? I asked, unable to fathom what the horrible task must be. No, oh, it's simple. We'll take you under the ground where the beings that run your world will consume your fear, and eventually your soul is sustenance he said in a cold tone. I immediately stood up and began to run, but no matter how far I ran, the man seemed to be right beside me. He wasn't running, no. He was just standing still, waiting for me to give up. I tried my best to keep going, but the sweltering heat didn't make it any better. I was far away from the concrete city now, but the man suddenly snapped his fingers, and I was back under the shade of the building. You can't escape, he smiled. And that's how I learned about the first rule of hell. There is no escape. But I got out, didn't I? How else would I be telling you this now? All I can say is that I'm extremely lucky. The man snapped his fingers once more and we were down in what looked to be a vast underground cellar. I saw people being attacked in each cell by unimaginable creatures. I got a headache looking at those creatures and could not look at them for a long time. The geometry of their bodies didn't make any sense. They had completely different parts. They weren't even composed of earthly colors. These were new colors that I had no words to describe. To this day, I will never get these screams in that cellar out of my head. As the man walked me through this horrible place, I only had one word in mind. Why? Your souls are very powerful. We feed on your fear and suffering. If we didn't do this, the earth and your reality would not exist. As a return for letting you live a life on the paradise and known as earth, you give us your souls. Don't worry though, this doesn't happen for eternity. Eventually, your souls are fully consumed to no more than empty husks. You will find plenty of wasted souls roaming around up above, the man explained. So there's no heaven, I pleaded. What about God? There is no heaven. God has long left your kind behind. He considers your kind a failure and lets us deal with you as we please. I stood there in the underground chamber as a suited man told me about the afterlife and how it works. You know what's worse than that though? 
Monday mornings. Okay, maybe not. I was quite literally dead. And now this man was going to chuck me in a cell for all of eternity. Except that didn't really happen. Don't worry, you really think we waste souls here first. No, at first we make them work. Make them keep the barrier between your reality and ours strong. The suited man said, immediately putting away the worst of my worries. And then, almost immediately, a weird being made entirely of light appeared next to us. The being did not have a definite shape and, looking at it, it was like looking at the sun. It seemed to stand there and communicate with the suited man before leaving. With the snap of his fingers, the suited man teleported us away from that chamber, and we were now instead inside. What I could only guess were one of the concrete buildings. There has been a mistake, Ethan, the man said in sorrow. What happened? I asked. And then suddenly, the world started to warp around me as if reality was still a body of water that was now rippling from an interruption. Colors started to swirl around like watercolor, and before I knew it, I found myself on the plane again with the sheet of rules clutched in my hand, and the same young man next to me. I had been given a second chance and this time, things would be a little different. I immediately looked away from the young man and ignored his cries for attention. I ignored the flight attendant too and suddenly the whole cabin was yelling at me. Their shouts nearly caught my attention and made me turn around to tell them to just shut up, but I stayed put and stared at my lap. Suddenly, the young man brought his head on my lap and stared directly into my eyes with those uncanny features. I could feel my heart in my throat as he slowly said in my mother's voice, Ethan, he teased as his voice shifted from my mother's to my dad's and then to the voices of some of my friends. I trembled and tried to avoid the completely disturbing features of his face so close to me by closing his eyes which only made him angrier. It seems the creatures had no way to touch me until I acknowledged them so I thought I was safe. The other rules were a breeze to follow except for the chaser one. The chaser was still Sarah and she started to come towards me as soon as the hour had started. I continued to run but Sarah followed after me calling for me. I tried not to get myself into a dead end and continued looping around the seats until the hour had passed. My legs were tired and I was utterly defeated. Soon the captain made a landing announcement and this time I managed to jump into the void. The void accepted me as it started to wrap its tendrils around me. All I could see was a thick ridge of velvety black as I fell and fell for who knows how long. I started to hear the rhythmic beeping of some sort of machinery and tried to focus on it until I realized what it was. I woke up in a hospital bed, covered from head to toe when a cast. Apparently, I had been involved in a serious car crash. The doctor said that I was dead for a total of three minutes and I had miraculously survived. You might ask me why I didn't tell the doctors about my experience. Well, they would never believe me. After years of rehab, I gained the ability to be able to do most things in life and everything started to become normal again. That is until the suited man visited me again. It was a cool Saturday evening, and I was going for a walk in the park to try and push myself to improve my health. My athletic ability hadn't been the same since the accident. He walked over to me, and I immediately froze as he held his hands up defensively in front of him to signify he meant no harm. I just want to explain some things, he offered sincerely. You were never supposed to go to hell, Ethan. It wasn't your time yet. When these souls' time comes... It is taken to hell in a sort of purgatory, you could say. It manifests differently depending on the person and your own unique purgatory was the plane. The flight attendant that gave you the list of rules realized the error and gave you the list to give you a chance to fight your way out of the purgatory and return to Earth. It was not in our power to return you ourselves, therefore you had to do it. I found you in hell unaccounted for and I was ready to put your soul to work. When another higher being told me to send you back in the plane and give you a second chance so that you could return, he explained. Cool, but why do you find the need to tell me that? I asked. 
because this time, your time has come for real. And I see it as a personal responsibility to finish off what we were on to last time. He said as his lips curled into a smile full of malice. I ran away from the man immediately, but I know that my death is near. All I can tell you guys is to enjoy your life while you still have it.